Thank you for inviting me to this uh, very, very special event. Uh, I've been studying emotions for more than 20 years. Used to think about it, uh, used to think about my topic as esoteric and uh, fighting to be part of the, the neuroscientific community, although I'm studying emotions. So it's really, really uh, exciting to be suddenly in the center of this uh, interest. And uh, I will um, try to tell you a little bit about uh, the brain and its relation to uh, and how it handles emotions or how it processes emotions. Um, I first want to thank a lot of my students mentioned on the left and some of my collaborators and the funding, uh, 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 founding foundations. And a um, special thank to Sami and Tova for supporting me and uh, helping me to make my dream true, <laughs> so to say. So as a psychiatrist, like you heard, I am a cognitive scientist, neuroscientist and a psychiatrist. And that actually motivated my, uh, my research to try and close the therapeutic gap in psychiatry. And uh, this gap, uh, can be um, represented by two people coming in the clinic and uh, complaining about completely different things and getting exactly the same diagnosis and prescribing, pres being prescribed the same therapy. Uh, I would summarize this situation as a problem of personalization and precision, or lack of personalization and lack of precision. And precision, uh, sorry, personalization is the, 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 our, stri our aim or goal in, in medicine to give unique therapy to each person. And it's the who issue. And the precision is about trying to uh, give a treatment that is mechanism and process driven rather than only symptoms. And unfortunately, uh, in psychiatry, we are far from there. Uh, from my clinical experience as a psychiatrist, I've been convinced, I was first a psychiatrist and then uh, turned into a neuroscientist, uh, I have been convinced that emotions are the building blocks of our mental health. And in order to help people alleviate their mental suffering, we need to understand what is an emotion. And uh, I took the road to do it uh, through studying the brain and trying to understand what are the brain mechanisms that uh, underlie emotions and identify them. Uh, and importantly, to unveil the complexity of emotions by using multi-scale measurements. And what do I mean? It's important so you can follow my lecture later on. So I'm using many different techniques to measure the brain and they have different qualities, advantages and uh, limitations. Uh, so functional MRI on the bottom uh, is well known for being great anatomically, uh, um, anatomical measure, but quite poor temporally because our neurons fire in milliseconds and fMRI gives, gives us information in seconds. While EEG and intracranial recordings from uh, the brain give us this temporal um, information but not always can give us the full picture of the brain like fMRI. So the solution is to combine and use both and I hope I will be able to show you that. And lastly, I try to take some of the insights that come out from my work in the lab and implement it in the real world. I think without that, we are wasting our time. And that's an effort by itself, and we should be all aware of it. Uh, OK, so starting from personalization, the problem here is that uh, emotional expressions are diverse and subjective. And when a person comes to the clinic and being assessed as depressed by telling us a lot of things is this, this person or these people actually uh, tell us very different things that I very schematically, I don't, I don't think you can see it, very schematically I presented it as two clouds or two clusters. On the left, the red cluster is um, 
uh, the expressions of affect, what I call affect, and it's basic universal feelings uh, of, uh, of emotions that often include physical feelings like tiredness and uh, pain. On the right side, there is the blue cloud that I call concept. And this actually alludes very nicely to Maya, and thank you for giving me this introduction. Uh, so it's the concept where people express their more cognitive aspect of their emotions. And we would hear things like no hope and unloved. And this is often related to our self-percept and also relations to other. So when someone says I'm depressed, this could be all of this. And in fact, we think the integration of these different feelings makes the emotional experience. Uh, and when we come to the brain and precision, here we have another problem where the brain is actually requires to process often what seems conflicting processes in terms of timing and, uh, and um, resolution. And on one hand, the affect uh, is uh, considered as an automatic and rapidly pro rapid process uh, related to reactivity and maybe to tagging safety or danger. And it's uh, assigning unique balance of value to things in the world. On the other hand, the concept is considered as a related to elaborative, relatively slower process that also relates to reflection, self-reflection, reflection on others. And it's based on memories and prior experience, and again, the self and others. So uh, just uh, this is to my title, to allude to my title, uh, and in the brain, very, very schematically, we, make, we must make things a little simple to make them then more complex. We can think about it as related to, to these processes as related to two systems in the brain. The prefrontal cortex related more to the concept uh, processes, while the limbic system, what was considered the, uh, traditionally the emotional brain, is related to the affect. Uh, of course, they are not working there separately, and in fact, in order to experience emotions, they must integrate and co-operate. Co and I will try to show it. So emotional experience is the integration of these two processes, at least two processes. And then comes Barrett and Mosquita, like also Maya mentioned, and they a little bit chattered the, the boat by saying, listen, this is, emotions are not static, there's really this dynamics, and it, in fact, these are emerging phenomena that uh, m very much like thinking, and here comes also the aha maybe, the aha moments. There are things coming and going all the time and interacting, and in fact, these processes are recursive and not separate, and the emotional experience is the moments where they meet and, and, and they modified. And more so, they claim, like also you heard, that emotions are there in order to help us behave adaptively. And our behavior, in fact, also change these processes. So there is this complexity of interaction between at least three processes that makes us feel emotions. So how can we take this to the lab and ask, uh, is it true, is these models have any validity in the, in, in the brain? So first, um, I would like to describe this uh, study uh, that aimed to uncover the synergy between process of concept and process of affect. And in order to do that, because most of the time these things are mixed, we use two modalities. Music on one hand, which is abstractive, abstractive relatively, uh, and and uh, brings up the affect, while a narrative coming from short videos that are very concrete in their story and uh, neutral in their affect, and uh, we looked what happened in the brain when we either see the movies alone or the music alone, or when they are combined, and by having two roots of this two processes, we were able to actually uh, look at the synergy. And uh, just to demo the situation that a person uh, sees and feels in the scanner, so this is the neutral movie, you see a car going in the, in the road, and, uh, and this is when we put music to it. 
Do you feel very happy? Immediately. So the same movie, but very different aspect to it. And then... So this is a very small manipulation that allows us to look at the combination. So when we look at the fMRI, this is an fMRI experiment. On the left you see visual only, on the right you see auditory. And here even because the music was very short, we don't even see the limbic system, although it's the affect. Uh, and when we see the, com when people experience the combined information, we, that's where we see the, uh, the limbic system represented here by the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex represented by the lateral prefrontal cortex. And we think this is where the synergy happens. But because this is fMRI, as I told you, resolution in time is very poor and we cannot really still separate them apart. For that, we uh, used intracranial recordings, uh, depth recordings and also subdural recordings. Uh, taken from the amygdala or the temporal lobe and from the prefrontal cortex in epilepsy patients, in patients with epilepsy who undergo assessment before surgery. So this is invasive, but in people that need this invasive uh, uh, procedure. And what we found here, very, very briefly, I tell you, is that the, the recordings from the limbic system, the areas in the limbic systems, in the combined condition, not in the movie alone, and not in the uh, music alone, uh, was very fuzzy and fast and high frequency. While the information, record, the, the recordings from the prefrontal cortex was actually reduced to the stimuli and was sustained throughout the video uh, uh, information. So this kind of suggests that maybe the limbic system is indeed the system that is processing rapidly uh, affective tagging, while the prefrontal cortex is coming in and providing the context and helping us to recursively interact with more information that comes from the world. So this is just uh, one, uh, one example of how we study these very complex questions of emotional processes and um, kind of support the idea that the prefrontal cortex and the limbic areas are indeed essential and they have different roles. Uh, another experiment that I want to share with you is going more deeper into dynamics, uh, not at the level of the neurons, but rather at the level of our experience, which is a little slower. And that's where we can use fMRI together with cinematic clips that now they are long, they are seven, eight minutes long, and we can already experience the story and the peaks of the emotions. And specifically, we study said movie, one of the studies we used said movie, Stepmom, uh, in which a mother, a dying mother, sep is separating from, their ch from her children. And it's a very, very uh, sad moment of... Uh, separation and uh, intimacy between the mother and the children. So people were actually passively viewing the movies while they were in the scanner, and when they came out, they reported how sad they are, they were. So we had the, their subjective experience of sadness as well as the whole brain. And here we looked at the whole brain, and uh, you have here in colors these three systems, three systems related to the three processes that I mentioned. The affect, the concept, and the action or the behavior. And uh, I'll show you how the brain is dynamically changing while people viewing these movies by connecting the dots. That means that these regions are actually co-modulated together or within the networks or between the networks. So a short movie again. You can view it and listen we to... Still have one thing, one of our greatest things we're going to always have. You know what that is? So you can see, you don't see so well, we but um, the mother is talking to the child and we telling him, him that he's go she's going to the sky and she will be a butterfly. Summer and in the winter and in the rain and the sun and... You can see how I each network is connected within itself, but also a little bit with other networks, so there is an integration. Okay, and on the top you see the subjective rating that people are Nobody rating ever. sadness. But when they hug, there is this full integration of the whole 
uh, all these areas that we are measuring from. And hugging is indeed a very um, embodied uh, moment oh, of their emotions. And uh, we strongly simulate with it. Made me. And uh, so I think this reflects better uh, about the idea of uh, a constructivist uh, theory in which uh, concept and affect come together to uh, create, the, to emerge, to, to form the emotional experience, but also lead to the behavior. But until now, I only showed you work where we measure perception and not behavior. In order to measure behavior, we must go to gaming. So in emotional experience, we have all these nice things because we have to evoke emotions. So here we created a, a paradigm uh, calling uh, Primo uh, in order to uncover behavioral choices that uh, come in the context of incentives, of motivations, of good and bad things that happens to us in the world. Uh, in, in, uh, in fact, uh, a person needs to move the discard man and try to catch uh, shekels and avoid balls. So on the way to the shekels, he has to take a risk and to avoid balls. And just to show you how active it is while you are in the scanner or while we are measuring your recordings from the brain. So this I will show you both uh, levels. So this is very active. And once in a while, he would caught the shekel. And other times, he will be hit with a ball. So we have rewards and we have punishment. And uh, I'm only showing you here the results from the intracranial recording. So we recorded from the prefrontal cortex and from the limbic system, amygdala and uh, hippocampus. The, the circles that you see are the neurons or bunch of uh, groups of neurons that are colored according to their sensitivity, either to the punishment, the reddish colors, or to the rewards, the more green, bluish colors. So even without being a neuroscientist, you can tell that uh, the prefrontal cortex is more sensitive to punishment. Uh, more neurons in the prefrontal cortex were more activated when people were punished when, rather than when they were rewarded. On the other hand, in the limbic system, in the amygdala and the hippocampus, we see mixture. But uh, the other thing, this is one finding. The other finding is that prefrontal cortex respond to punishment a little bit before the limbic system, actually. And the last finding is the most interesting, I think, is that the limbic system, actually, when it responds to, respond to punishment, it affects the next choice a behavioral choice that people make towards avoidance. So it seems that the limbic system is actually most influential of the behavior, but it gets the information from the prefrontal cortex. So here we all the way to the behavior in humans and looking at the brains. So I think, I hope I convince you by now that uh, we can parcel out and try to study this very complex phenomena even in the brain and that um, prefrontal cortex is important, but it seems that the limbic system is really crucial to our uh, well-being. And uh, the last part, I will try in my in the, the last uh, minutes to show you how we take such an insight all the way to the clinic. And uh, here, um, I will focus on the amygdala uh, because there is accumulating evidence that the amygdala specifically is involved in psychopathology. Uh, in our studies, we showed, and then it was also shown by others, that hyperactive amygdala could be a, a vulnerability marker for stress reaction, pathological stress reaction after exposure. And uh, others showed that amygdala is involved in anxiety, in phobia, and in PTSD, hyperactive amygdala. So it seems that at least if we could uh, uh, harness the amygdala to the clinical uh, practice, we could help people uh, improve their uh, psychiatric condition. And the approach I would like to present to you here, I think, give us the, uh, a promising uh, path to harness the brain for our well, mental, health, uh, uh, mental health. And this is brain-computer interface approach, also known as neurofeedback. You heard a little bit about similar things yesterday with the people who were in the, in the dinner. 
uh, but here it's about connecting between our mental state and our brain state. And this is being done by contingent feedback when they are actually associated. So people apply a certain mental strategy and the aim for them is to change something in the brain. When these two are uh, aligned, people get feedback and they get positive feedback. So it becomes reinforcement learning for volitional neuromodulation. So non-invasively, people actually learn to control the brain. And of course, I don't have time to show you all the evidence, but uh, there is a lot of work showing that this is possible, uh, actually also in animals, not only in humans. So it's not all conscious. It could be also done implicitly. Uh, and I will only try to show you how we go about doing it for the amygdala. So I already told you that the best way to measure the amygdala is the fMRI anatomically. But if we want to measure, if we want to now provide treatment to many people and in an affordable manner to be scalable, we cannot really use the fMRI and take it home and take it and bring everyone to the fMRI. And for that, we need to move to other measurements that are more scalable, like the electrical encephalogram, the EEG. And uh, the problem is that the EEG doesn't read well from deep brain areas. So the signals that we get are not precise anatomically, and we want to be precise. We want the amygdala. And to deal with this, we combined information from fMRI and EEG and computationally uh, developed models that represent information from the fMRI in the EEG ended up in what we call electrical fingerprint, a model of the EEG. And with this, we can do the neurofeedback now that target the amygdala. Of course, I have to prove, I, have, I had to prove it before I can say that, and I don't have time to show you, but this is possible. And we already showed that when people trained uh, to deregulate their electrical fingerprint, we can uh, improve their stress resilience, we can reduce their PTSD symptoms, we can reduce pain symptoms, and we can alleviate depression. So there is a, a lot to do here yet, uh, but we are on our way, I hope. Uh, and this we call process-based neurofeedback because we are neuroanatomically specific and also using interface that is context specific and psychiatry is about context so it's really important the way we feedback and i will uh, end with this uh, with this video that is actually a neurofeedback based on amygdala eeg we call it waiting room scenarios people view this uh, scenario which is virtual uh, in 3d and hear the sounds and the sounds are negative so the uh, the aim of the person that is trained is to lower the sound and sit the people. And uh, when this is successful, you can see the signal going down. Uh, people are sitting down and the sound is being reduced. So this is the feedback for the person that is actually on his way or her way to uh, associate mental state with a, a mental, with a brain state. In this case, downregulating. And we can also teach people to upregulate, and then the people will stand up and the sound will be much uh, more uh, intense. So, to summarize all of this, uh, I hope we are on our way to have a future psychiatric clinic in which we don't only think symptoms and signs, we think brain, and we not only think brain fMRI, we also think brain with measurements that are scalable and we can take them home and we can measure more and more of them and learn more and more of the brain. And we can interact when we consider the disorder as a set of emotional processes that uh, can be guided or can be uh, related to different types of treatment. I only showed you one treatment, but I actually think we should use all of the treatments that we have in an in a, um, uh, intelligent way or in a process-oriented way, psychotherapy, drug therapy, as well as neurofeedback. Thank you.
Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, one quick question. There are also tools to stimulate the brain, like TMS or deep TMS. So you can put on your brain this uh, and, and target specific regions, you know, uh, automatically. And there are people that are using. Can you say a word about this intervention? Uh, I want to uh, differentiate between them. The TMS or transcranial magnetic stimulation is, or, or, or there are also other things like TDCS, and of course there are the invasive things also. Uh, they are uh, actually coming from outside trying to change the brain. Uh, here I am suggesting something that actually connects your internal uh, stream of information of emotion with your brain and gives you the control to change your brain. So I think these are very different approaches and uh, they could be complementary, actually. And uh, I don't think the precision is so good in TMS and TDCS, but you could improve them. You could improve the precision if you combine them with cognitive tasks that are specific. So the idea, like we are using it, if you activate a certain system in the brain, and then you can modulate it more specific. So people do it in TMS and as well as in neurofeedback.